Good day to everyone for joining us for this session of Ask Me Anything, uh, raising your first round. So raising your first round from external investors can be disorienting and confusing to many entrepreneurs, especially for first-time entrepreneurs. So for this um, Ask Me Anything session, we've got an angel investor, we've got an VC as well as an entrepreneur with us today to share a bit more about your um, to share a bit more about their perspective on startups raising their first round. We'll have Hui Jie do a very quick introduction about yourself. Yeah, very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone globally. Uh, this is Hui Jie here. I'll consider myself a technopreneur, having been business for the last 16 years, of which 14 years has been in technology. I ran several startups as well as in the corporate space and brought my own company public before. So today I run a group called Vision Group. We very much position ourselves as a humanity plus company focused on using technology for betterment of human race. We look at data as one of the key things, looking at technology such as blockchain for data trust, AI for data clarity, and cybersecurity for peace of mind. So we basically are quite a young company. We're just coming three years old. And we're just at the final legs of closing up our Series A round on an eight-digit raise at a nine-digit valuation. Great meeting, everyone, and looking forward to the next couple of minutes. It must be quite exciting raising, doing fundraising during this period of time. Oh, yes, of course. Totally different playing field, I'll say. Yeah, I think, I think that kind of sets very nicely into my first opening question uh, while we wait for the different que um, questions to fill to stream in through Pigeonhole. So we have known that 2020 is quite a unique year um, because of COVID, we also see uh, travel restriction. And because of that, I think um, investors, the way investors do their due diligence or the way startups have looked at fundraising has kind of shifted. So I'd like to pose a question to Xiaoning and Davina first. Um, how has the due diligence process um, changed for you in Joe Centra as well as East Ventures? Okay, so I'll, I'll go first then. Um, I, I think the, the challenge part is really, so for a lot of angel investors, we focus a lot on trying to get to know the founders better because especially for, for such early stage, there's really very little tractions, very little numbers to bank on. So it's really very much interaction with the founders. So through Zoom, it's really very difficult. You can't, you can't you can't read the body language you can really just see you know really based on this but we try our best so um in this year um very very uh openly um our syndicates are actually still went ahead we still did seven cases we still managed to to close this but on the on the whole i would say the process is longer because you tend to need to speak to them a lot more you need to get a sense of them better um so on Angel Central, so actually this year we wanted to do a lot more in the regional countries. We wanted to spend more time with uh, the Vietnamese ecosystem and the Indonesia ecosystem. But all the plans has to be put on hold. But on my own uh, investment, so I have a portfolio of 35 companies in my, in my own personal portfolio. So usually we will travel around. So, so that's my excuse to travel, right? I will travel around to visit the company to see how they're doing. But this year, everything is true. So... So on the new deals, yes, the due diligence take longer, but it has, still has to be done because um, so we are, I would encourage angel investors to be disciplined. Regardless of timing, you still need to do your portfolio approach and make sure that you, you spread out your, your investment, right? Um, but I would say that visiting portfolio companies, it's, it's something that we have to hold back. Um, that affected our, our sensing a little. And sometimes when you can't see them face-to-face, -face, the support is it's on a different level yeah so it's affected by i think um i would say business as usual to maybe 70 percent yeah i think it's really good to hear that investors uh both angels as well as the vcs are are keeping pace um still looking at investments um and you know actively looking out for um good companies to invest in um, we've got a question from the audience. Um, maybe I'll pose this to Hui Jie. Uh, for a startup that's raising a pre-seed round, um, are angel investors and early stage VCs the only option? Are there other um, investors or other type of capital that um, an early stage startup could look at? Well, I guess uh, for most early stage startups, the first round, they always go to friends and family. 
uh, that's where, you know, at the same time, they are getting commitment, right? Because this will be people that be meeting every single New Year or Christmas or Chinese New Year. And probably they'll be asking you, hey, how's the money and how's the company doing? And that basically motivates entrepreneurs to make sure to a certain extent they don't screw up as well. So I guess that's always the first um, so-called uh, groups of people that we actually engage. But going towards angels and VCs is always recommended as well because that entire exercise helps also the entrepreneur and the startup to sort of clean up the act, to make it more accurate, to make sure that they are really hitting the problem right, right at the, the main pain point, looking at the solution that can solve that specific pain point as well. So I, I always believe strongly that going towards uh, venture capital and angels are so always a good um, exercise to have because at the same time, um, very much angels and VCs are plucked into the system. And basically, if they know the idea works or the idea doesn't work, they can probably give some valuable feedback as well. Yeah, thanks. I think, I think it's always good to reach out to people beyond your friends and family to kind of validate whether the idea really work uh, from time to time. But yet at the same time, I think friends and families, well, because you meet them on a regular basis, you need to be committed. I do have another question on um, strategic partnerships. So let's say if someone's looking for a strategic partnership, who will be the best type of investors that, um, that a startup should look at? Angel, VCs, corporates? I guess many a time, it really depends more on the person that the investor or so-called the specific person that uh, the startup is talking to. I mean, there might be out there, there might be uh, angels as well as venture capital groups, but many a time it's really about who that entrepreneur is interacting with within the group. It might be a huge corporate and it might have a huge network or large VC or large uh, angel group, but many a time it's the person that they're interacting with that has that close connection or would be the one that can actually bridge them to the right person as well. So many a time, there's a good brands out there in terms of ventures and angel groups. But I think for the startup entrepreneur, it's more important to know who's the person you can pick up a phone and call and whether that person will actually bridge him to the right party uh, rather than just relying on the brand of the corporate or the investor group itself. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. I think, um, Shaoning, do you have anything to add? I wanted to say that Hui Jie use a very good word, right? The investors serve as a very good bridge. So, but we need to be very clear that the founders still need to be the one to do the work to actually build the partnership. So after we make the phone call, it's really much in your hands on what happens because the investors cannot make it happen for you. Um, so Hui Jie, there is a question which I think that you'll be able to answer. So there's a question on how much equity should a startup be willing to give up in the first round? That's always a very tough question, right? Because uh, how much to dilute and how much to raise? I guess the starting point is always how much does the business need in order for the business to move on to the next round? And sometimes some startups are looking at trying to raise too much or sometimes they're raising too little and that basically sorts of mess up well, very much with the so-called the heartbeat of the startup moving very much the next round. So fundamentally, before looking at equity or how much to dilute, the first thing really is what does the startup actually need in order to bring the startup to the next round in terms of funds, as well as use of proceeds, multiply that by another 1.2 to 1.3 to make sure you have enough buffer because you want to end up in a state that you do not have enough funds. So I think that's very much number one. Number two, then it goes down to how much to actually dilute. I think very much from market perspective, anywhere from 10 to 25 or 30% sometimes, um, it's something that look at 30% might be too much on the high side, probably around 10 to 20% might be something that look at um, most of the times, usually on our end, a simple rule of thumb is usually anywhere from between 10 to 20%, at least personally for myself. Um, take note that the startup, every time when you start, it's always good to build up a cap table for the future rounds that the startup is planning to have in the next three rounds or five rounds. Um, because you don't want to end up in a state that when you're at your third or fifth round, uh, the founders actually end up with little or almost insignificant equity, even though the startup might be highly valued and a high valuation, because then uh, you're just giving away uh, everything. So by having that cap table and building up through multiple rounds, at least 
the founders and the founding team know what they're in it for and eventually what they would end up with after the end of three or five rounds if the start is successful? I think there are also a couple of questions. I'll take them together on um, negotiation with potential investors. Um, so maybe I'll start with Hui Jie first because you have done a few rounds of fundraising or so. Um, how do you negotiate term sheets um, with investors? How do you negotiate better terms uh, for yourself? I, I guess the first thing first uh, in negotiations, uh, you need to know what's your bottom line and what's your target. And many a time, it's not, it's more uh, art rather than a science, so it's a combination of both. Um, depending on who you're talking to as well, do you need them more or do they in a way want you more as well? So, and also depends on which range or which series you're currently at, uh, at that point of time as well. So always a good indication is to talk to a couple of angels, a couple of venture capitals, a couple of um, so-called uh, later stage uh, fund to get a little bit of an idea. And if like 10 to 20 of them says the same thing, probably you already have a rough indication of so-called what the valuations might be like uh, from a negotiation basis. So with those options, you can then decide which would be of better fit. But many a time, it's not just about the money, it's more about the strategic value. So how do we actually put the value to that um, in that particular aspect? I guess in negotiations, when it comes to that, it means that the investor is already interested. The investor probably has done a little bit of due diligence and both parties want to take it forward. The only question then now is what value you place on them and what value they place on you. So the interesting thing is that sometimes the value is different. The things which are important to the investor might not be as important to you. The things which are important to you might not be as important to the investor. So it's always very critical to know what the investor wants and what you want. And that really is the art part in putting together um, so-called a value proposition that both sides will be able to agree on. Sometimes you give up things that you don't feel that valuable on, but which is important to the investor. Sometimes the investor will be able to give away something that they might not feel that valuable on. So it's always important to have that discussion. The rest of it boils down to numbers. There's always a market figure. And if you can find something that's of high value to the investor, probably that figure can shift a little bit, uh, sometimes a lot, depending if they really want it. But more or less, there's always a market so-called range that you can look into. At least that's my perspective. Moving on to what happens after an investment is done. So if in any event that an investor as well as a startup have some uh, conflicting ideas on the business, um, how should they take it? Should they have a discussion and make the decision together or um, what will be the best way forward? I guess many a time, right? Once we deal with people, everyone always have um, different opinions. Of course, the first step is always to try to um, set the alignment of the direction and the vision right before the investors do come in. But of course, after that, you know, things actually um, is very different after a relationship starts. I, I guess end of the day, it's always it's very much like dealing with all the different stakeholders within a company, whether it's a partner, an investor, or a customer, it's always important to have a conversation and understand where the stakeholders are coming from, whether the investor or customer. And at the end of the day, it's very important to continue to keep that relationship because you're already, in a way, in a marriage together. And the whole circle is really small. If you end up arguing with your investor, trust me, he's going to tell every single other friend and person in all the other so-called groups he's talking about. So you always want to make sure that you keep that specific relationship. And, you know, very much as uh, young founders, we always have our own thinkings. And it's because we have our own thinking, that's the reason why we push um, and, and do what we actually do. But sometimes we need to take a step back as well to understand why was that specific point being brought forth from that specific investor? Maybe because they are plugged into the ecosystem for specific industries. Maybe it's because um, they might have certain insights uh, due to other investment portfolios they have made. So usually what I personally do myself is I hear, I listen, and same thing, I always do market validation. If you think that's a good idea, let's test it out. Let's try it out for three months and six months and run a concurrent track. If I believe strongly in one specific track and there was this other track that you think might be strongly important that 
you believe strongly that is uh, the way to go, normally I'll still always test out. The market will be the ones that tell me whether that eventually works or not. And that gives me two things. Number one, areas of opportunities that I might not miss out on. And number two, the investor knows that basically we have tried it out. And many, more importantly is that many a time an investor recommend that, they will sometimes also share their own network. They say, oh, you know, that's a good area to actually explore. In fact, I'm going to introduce one or two people that can explore the area as well. And that is the own investor's reputation on the line. You know, if that was a bad idea, it didn't work out, that's invested money that investor has actually put in. So I guess it's really about having that conversation together with the investor to understand where did they come from and there must be a reason why they raised that out. And eventually, if we test it out, the market says, great, it works. That's fantastic. If it doesn't, we have got a new learning lesson as well. So at least that's how I handle it. We have time for one last question. So a very quick one. Um, what happens if the startup's exit strategy does not match the fund's exit strategy? Yeah, I guess in terms of exit, right, of course, every investor wants to see a good return on their uh, investments. Um, and in terms of exit, uh, it, it really is different case by case. Um, so from our personal experience, the company managed to raise bigger rounds in the future. Typically, they would like to clean the cap table and offer a secondary transaction to the earlier investors. And whether these investors decide to take it or not will be uh, all depending on their uh, risk appetite and their internal strategy. Typically, from what I've seen, though, is uh, after uh, three to four rounds, maybe uh, if the earlier investors are provided the chance to, to uh, sell their shares, they will do it because uh, it's uh, usually already bring them like a, a sufficient return. But um, yeah, I guess in terms of exit, uh, it will all be different depending on the investor's uh, appetite and how they see the, the investments going forward. It's really not easy sometimes. It's always important to ask the investors that are coming in, what's their expectations? Because uh, sometimes uh, as we go into later rounds, uh, sometimes the investors, earlier investors want to exit. And typically the funds that come in, it's more to build a business rather than exit early investors, unless you have really very much later rounds already. Um, so typically this is something that uh, we always need to have a conversation first for expectations with investors that come in. And sometimes the business actually grow faster or grow slower. And uh, then that's where expectations actually mismatch. Um, but it's always good to have expectations first before the investors come in. Um, that's the best way to mitigate anything and just have a real conversation after that. Thank you, Xiaoning, Davina, and Hui Jie for you know, sharing your views. Thanks, Xiaoning. Thanks, Davina. Thanks, Hui Jie. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.